Hello, we are here in Philadelphia from the American Art Association Scientific Session of 2019 and uh, it is for, with me here, Professor Greg Stone from Mount Sinai Health System and the Cardiovascular Research Foundation. Thank you so much, Professor Stone, for uh, being with us today and thank you for all the scheme investigators for providing us with this uh, incredible information from the ischemia trial. It's been our honor, Francesco, thank you. You've been waiting 12 years and more than $100 million have been spent with this extremely important trial. According to somebody, this is the most important clinical trial in recent cardiovascular history. Could you please outline the design and the main results of this important trial to us? Sure. Well, what we saw after the COURAGE trial, which was done more than a decade ago, was that in patients with stable coronary disease, PCI, primarily with bare metal stents, didn't make patients live longer, and it didn't prevent heart attacks. Patients did feel better, they had less angina, but those effects were pretty much gone by three years. Now, ischemia, I'm sorry, COURAGE was done in an earlier era with bare metal stents, not drug eluting stents, and patients were enrolled in COURAGE after the angiogram was known. So many of the patients who were the sickest with the most severe coronary anatomy and with extensive ischemia were not enrolled in the trial. And we've known for a long time that there's an association between ischemia and death and heart attack. So in the ischemia trial, which was funded by the United States government, the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, we took 5,179 patients who had at least moderate or severe ischemia on a stress test. They had mild symptoms so they could be managed with medical therapy. And before doing an angiogram, we did a CAT scan to make sure that they didn't have left main disease. And if they didn't have left main disease, but they did have coronary artery disease, then they were randomized to either a conservative strategy of treating them with best medical therapy, what we call optimal medical therapy, or on a background of the same optimal medical therapy to then undergo angiography to define the coronary anatomy and to revascularize as appropriate with either PCI or coronary bypass graft surgery. And of course in the PCI arm we now use the best drug eluting stands and imaging uh, the best techniques we have. And we followed these patients for um, a median of about 3.3 years and the primary point was a composite of cardiovascular death, myocardial infarction, um, resuscitated cardiac arrest, or rehospitalization for either unstable angina or heart failure. We had uh, two major secondary endpoints, just cardiovascular death or MI alone, and quality of life improvement. So we finally have the results of this trial after, you say, many, many uh, years. Uh, this trial was a massive effort that enrolled, again, these 5,179 patients from 320 sites from 37 countries, uh, and it was a huge international effort. And what we found was that there was not a major difference in the overall composite endpoint, the five component composite endpoint, or in the secondary clinical endpoint of cardiovascular death or MI. But it was very interesting. Myocardial infarctions drove the endpoint, and there was a slight increase in periprocedural myocardial infarctions, but then over time there were less and less spontaneous myocardial infarctions. So actually at the end of the day, at about four years, there tended to be about 2% fewer events in the invasively treated patients compared to the conservatively treated patients, which was a borderline statistically significant finding. But overall, the, the early hazard, the late benefit, the curves crossed at about two years, no overall major differences. Uh, intervention, which was done about three quarters of the time with PCI, one quarter of the time with cabbage, was extremely safe. There was no excess in myocardial infarction, there was no excess in strokes. While there were a few extra periprocedural MIs, those were more than made over, um, over time with a reduction in spontaneous myocardial infarction. So we did validate what was seen in the FAME 2 trial that PCI of ischemia producing lesions did reduce spontaneous myocardial infarction. Uh, and it did it safely. Now, the quality of life results were actually fascinating. There was a substantial improvement in quality of life. 
both the overall Seattle Angina questionnaire assessment of angina frequency, as well as what's called the SAC summary score, which overall looks at physical well-being and other aspects of quality of life. And this was seen very early, as soon as three months after the procedure, and it was sustained all the way out to uh, 36 months, and actually out to 48 months. And this effect was substantial. So the number of needed to treat to make one patient angina free was about three to five patients, depending on where you looked and how much baseline angina there was. The more angina there was at baseline, the better the patients did relatively over time. Uh, but even patients with very mild angina, what was monthly angina on their baseline tests, had fewer symptoms during follow-up with the invasive approach compared to the conservative approach. Now, in contrast, patients who had no symptoms at baseline um, within at least four weeks prior to randomization, and that was about a third of the patients, had no significant improvement in uh, um, angina frequency or quality of life. Well, I should couch that. There was a small improvement, but it was a very minimal improvement, probably not clinically relevant. So what we saw overall, if I put all of this together, was that an invasive approach, which is not just PCI, this is PCI or cabbage, but preceded by angiography in patients with relatively mild symptoms, stable coronary disease, normal left ventricular ejection fractions for the most part, no heart failure, no left main disease. Um, but if you go to the cath lab to find their anatomy and revascularize them on a background of optimal medical therapy compared to optimal medical therapy alone, you tended to have slightly fewer events over time. We could argue about whether it was a strong trend or not because there was slight harm early on but benefit later on with a slight overall difference at the end of the study. So clinical events was mostly a wash, but the quality of life improvements were definite, substantial, and durable in patients who had any level of angina at baseline, but were not present in patients who were asymptomatic at baseline. So, Professor Stone, these yeah. results are absolutely remarkable, and we know yeah. that uh, in clinical practice, when we treat patients, it's not only the final outcome, but also the quality of life that the patients right. have that is extremely important down the road. So, taking all together these results, what right. is your main take-home message and how this trial will affect your clinical practice tomorrow morning sure. in, the, in the cat lab? Well, first of all, the ischemia trial applies to a very specific type of patient. Again, these are patients with um, documented coronary artery disease by a CT scan, but without left main disease, with moderate or severe ischemia, who have relatively mild symptoms that can be controlled with antianginal medication. So it doesn't apply to patients who are highly, highly symptomatic or with acute coronary syndromes, non-STEMI or STEMI, or threatened myocardial infarction, or with heart failure, or reduced left ventricular ejection fraction, um, or, as I mentioned, with left main disease. But given with those types of patients, we not infrequently see somebody who has a markedly positive stress test. Maybe they're asymptomatic, maybe they have only mild angina, and many people think that's an emergency. We should admit them right away, we've got to do an angiogram. So the first thing we learned is it's not an emergency. Okay, those patients, one, with good medical therapy, had relatively low mortality. We're talking about only one to one and a half percent mortality per year, and there was no sudden urgent bump after diagnosis. So you have time to think about what to do. And we've learned so much from the ischemia trial, you've got to weigh the pros and the cons of these two different approaches. You could undergo a conservative approach. You should do a CT scan to rule out left main disease, but if the patient and if the physician is not inclined to angiography and catheterization, it was perfectly safe, the survival was identical, to um, try medical therapy first, uh, once you've, again, ruled out left main disease. And then if the patient develops um, either side effects from the drugs or symptoms that are uncontrollable or he's, he or she is unsatisfied with, then you can always do an angiogram and then revascularize as appropriate. So in contrast, if you, if the, you or the patient wants more rapid relief of symptoms, 
uh, and understands that there'll be a slight increase risk of periprocedural myocardial infarction, but that will be more than counterbalanced by a reduction in late spontaneous myocardial infarctions, and that was a benefit that was continuing to spread over time, then it would be very reasonable to forego the CT scan and upfront go to diagnostic angiography followed by revascularization with PCI or bypass surgery as appropriate. So I don't expect that this will um, affect many people's practices tremendously because I think people already have their biases of whether they should be conservative or more um, aggressive. However, I think it fills in a lot of the missing data and so we can really make better informed choices. Asymptomatic patients probably should be treated more conservatively until they develop symptoms. If they develop symptoms, then they can undergo angiography and go to the cath lab. Uh, the background of optimal medical therapy is very important for all these patients. So established coronary disease, we have to drive the LDL down to less than 70 milligrams per deciliter. Patients have to stop smoking, their blood pressure has to get controlled, their diabetes has to be controlled, etc. So that's the foundation. But that you know, once we get beyond that, stable ischemic heart disease, we're not saving lives, we're treating primarily to either prevent late heart attacks or to improve quality of life and symptom control. So, Professor Stone, somebody said that uh, it's more easy to break an atom than a prejudice. How do you think that uh, this novel information will be implemented and accepted by the public, by the patients, and by the media? We already seen uh, from the media and the most important international journals that uh, they may have misinterpreted some of the data that are coming from the trial. How do you think that we can uh, solve these problems with, uh, with the public? Well, as always, it takes many years for the results of clinical trials, most clinical trials, to have a major effect on clinical practice. And within those years, we have time to educate our colleagues. We have time to dive deep into the trial. I mean, the ischemia results are not even published yet. There was not simultaneous publication, so they haven't even undergone peer review. Uh, when you said the journals are already publishing uh, a certain viewpoint, by that you mean the media. And of course, the media are not physicians taking care of patients, and the media often get it wrong. So we have time to educate the media and to give them the nuances of every trial, because not most trials are not black and white. And most trials, especially $100 million trials like ischemia that take 10 years to perform, uh, are very complicated. And they have um, some pros and they have some cons. And in every randomized trial, there are some patients who benefit, there are some patients who are harmed, and other patients who do fine with both therapies. So it behooves us to dig very deep into the data to try to understand it fully before making major practice changes. That being said, I think that physicians in general, most of them, are quite intelligent and will all want to learn from this trial. We've learned that there's, it's, it's not an emergency when you see a patient with minimal symptoms and a lot of ischemia. You don't have to immediately admit the patient to the hospital for an urgent cath. That's very clear, and I think all doctors can learn from that, interventionalists as well as uh, cardiologists alike. Uh, but then whether or not the patient's overall would um, uh, be uh, more optimally treated with a conservative invasive approach, I think we have to take the time to talk to the patient. And the patient preferences are becoming, of course, more and more important in day-to-day -day practice. And we realize that unless therapies are markedly different in their outcomes, when you get to approximately the same place, and both places are reasonable places, that we should let the patient make the decision. And that will also um, not only empower the patient, make them the patient happier, but also make them more compliant with the therapies that they choose. So here you've got two distinct choices. You've got some upfront risks, but, but some um, reduction in late-term events. You have some modest changes, but substantial changes in quality of life. But you don't have to uh, accept that as an early choice. You can wait if you want. Uh, so the patient will have a lot. Some patients will want to jump at the opportunity to feel a lot better tomorrow. 
and then knowing that uh, they'll take the risk of a procedure and knowing that once that's done, they're hopefully going to be better for many, many years. Other patients would much rather take a much conservative approach. So I think it will take as many, many years to try to over overcome those prejudices and those biases and hopefully the scientific approach with no one being too dogmatic, as I've tried to do and try to emphasize both the strengths and the weaknesses or the pros and the cons of both approaches will allow us to recognize that uh, both are acceptable therapies with some differences and I think that's the scientific way to method and way to be. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Stone.